Welcome. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm Penny Cooper and I'm joined by Nicola Cohn from 39 Essex Chambers. We're going to be giving a seminar this afternoon all about witness evidence, witnesses giving evidence, getting it right first time. Just some introductions um, and some notes about this webinar and then we'll get started. So I've been a barrister since 1990 and devised the English model of the witness intermediary scheme. I now work in a number of jurisdictions around the world, advising and training on the use of witness intermediaries. And in England and Wales, conduct a lot of work related to witness evidence, witness preparation in high profile commercial cases, and also advising when witnesses have additional needs uh, in, for example, PI cases, extradition cases, and so on. Uh, Nicola is a barrister who's an expert in public and human rights law. Her work includes personal injury, regulatory and disciplinary law, court of protection and judicial review. She's also on the Treasury panel of Junior Counsel and Equality and Human Rights Commission panel of counsel. I'm going to go first, then uh, Nicola. We will open this up to questions uh, from you if you want to type those in to the, the Q&A uh, pop-up panel. We'll deal with as many of those as we can in the next hour. Please um, do bear in mind that if you're going to type your question, it will mean that uh, it is going to be discussed publicly and seen and uh, discussed amongst those who are watching uh, at the moment and those who will be watching it later because this is being recorded. It's part of a series that we run at 39 Essex Chambers uh, and generally runs on a Thursday at 3.30. It'll be available within days on the Chambers website as a recording. I'm going to start uh, sharing slides now. So I will disappear for, for uh, a moment and then you'll hear me again. Okay. So what we're going to cover today is uh, the essence of great witness preparation for civil cases. Uh, we're going to talk about improving the quality of witness evidence, uh, touching on case law, rules, practice directions and judicial guidance. We're also going to be talking about extra special adjustments in courts and tribunals for witnesses, including when to use witness intermediaries and the case examples that we'll be discussing at the end. Uh, they are all about uh, cases where there has been an issue of using about using an intermediary uh, and uh, Nicola will be particularly focusing on that. So witnesses giving evidence, uh, really you can't think about that these days without touching on the principle of effective participation. It's something that in my experience I think we're hearing a lot more about uh, in case law and in new practice directions and so on. And what is that in essence? Well, it's the principle that a witness or indeed a party should be enabled to participate effectively in any hearing that, uh, that relates to them. What is effective participation? There's very little actually said in terms of a definition when you look at uh, case law. And I undertook over the last couple of years, funded by the Nuffield Foundation, a research project with, with colleagues at the university where I'm a part-time uh, visiting professor, looking at practitioners' views on what participation entails. And one of the striking things was that participation means different things to different practitioners. And we interviewed over 150 lawyers, judges, and other professionals who work in uh, courts and tribunals and did over 200 hours worth of observations in various different courts and tribunals to look at participation in practice and what we concluded was that effective participation uh, covers a number of things we came up with 10 participation points they are going to be published in a book. It's going to be free to download, thanks to the Nuffield Foundation. And I, I've included the hyperlink to where you can find that book in, in September when it comes out. And effective participation includes, obviously, you might think, provision of and elicitation of information from a witness. But it's other things as well. Uh, it's about them being informed about the process. And it's also about them being protected from any uh, adverse um, results of being involved in that hearing. 
So that's participation in general. So one part of participation is witnesses giving evidence. And again, like effective participation, there is a lot of talk these days about best evidence from witnesses. What is best evidence? Probably the three words that are most useful for the practitioner, the lawyer to think about when trying to get the best evidence from a witness is, is that it's going to be complete, coherent and accurate. And I didn't come up with that. I take that from a definition of the best quality evidence within the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act 1999, which brought in special measures for vulnerable witnesses in the criminal justice system. And I think it's true to say that the increasing emphasis over the last 20 years on doing more to support witnesses to participate effectively in criminal uh, cases has had a significant knock-on effect in other parts of the justice system. And we'll hear a bit more about that later as I go through these slides. Personally, I think the essence of great witness preparation is about building rapport with your witness. It's vital as a part of good preparation when you are taking statements from witness, but also when you're preparing them for a hearing. We're going to concentrate mainly in this webinar uh, today about preparing witnesses for hearings, but much of what uh, we're saying actually applies to witnesses when they're, they're having their statements taken as well. You need to build rapport so that you can elicit information, but not just the facts that you want from them in order to prepare a witness statement, but also as it approaches the hearing, how they feel about giving evidence. And you need that rapport in place in order that you can uh, ask comfortably and they can respond comfortably to a question. How do you feel about giving evidence? And that might lead into you asking them if they think they might need any particular adjustments for the hearing. But of course, in order to know whether or not they might need any particular adjustments, they need to have been prepared for what to expect in the first place. I also firmly believe that for witnesses who get mock cross-examination experience, they're much better prepared for uh, the hearing, for being cross-examined in particular. And as I've said already, I do an awful lot of witness preparation in, particularly, uh, in particular in large commercial cases. Mock cross-examination is absolutely fine and it's of great benefit as long as it's within the rules. And we have to go back as far as 2005 when Lord Judge was the Lord Chief Justice to see the case of Momadou to know what the Court of Appeal has said about witness familiarisation, including things like it's important to keep proper records, and it is important that mock cross-examination stays well away from the facts of the particular case. It is absolutely not a dress rehearsal for uh, the hearing. Uh, it's not about cross-examining somebody on anything remotely like the facts that they're going to be giving evidence on. So what else do we need to think about when we are preparing witnesses? Well, in particular, the guidance in the Equal Treatment Bench Book. It's no surprise to me to see that not only in the Equal Treatment Bench Book, it was updated uh, earlier this year, and the very recent Good Practice for Remote Hearings, emphasis is on effective communication. Both those publications, and again, the hyperlinks in the slide, say effective communication underlies the entire legal process, ensuring that everyone involved understands and is understood. Otherwise, the legal process will be impeded or derailed. There's masses of information in the Equal Treatment Bench Book, which is, it's brilliant. It's so long these days, it's not the sort of thing you'd pick up and uh, read through, uh, probably, from cover to cover. But it is a sort of book that you can go to online, freely accessible, if you have a particular issue. For example, if you had a witness who was um, incapacitated due to mental illness, for example, then you could go there and see what the Equal Treatment Bench Book says about that. There is also the Advocates Gateway, which has been widely judicially endorsed. Some, uh, some of you may have seen that already or even used it. It's a website that I co-founded in 2012, and the basis of it is producing uh, easy to access, free to access guides for 
advocates who are planning to question a witness who is vulnerable and there are a number of different toolkits on there training video and other resources feel free to have a look at that if you haven't already uh, become familiar with it witnesses in civil cases in particular you'll be aware there are specific rules indeed whichever jurisdiction you're working in when you're thinking about witness evidence and potentially asking for adaptations for a particular witness, you need to look at the jurisdiction specific rules, case law, practice directions. Uh, for those who are familiar with family law, for example, you'll know that in 2017, there was a new uh, practice direction about effective participation of witnesses and um, plenty of detailed uh, guidance there uh, in the new rule and the practice direction about what to do if a witness is vulnerable and I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be vulnerable in just a moment. Uh, in the civil courts plenty of uh, rules and practice directions, uh, just one here for example, obviously the statement uh, needs to contain the statement of truth and the practice direction 22 that goes along with that has a lot more detail about that and indeed Practice Direction 35 and uh, Rule 35 for expert witnesses if you're dealing with an expert witness. So the point being really to look at what is uh, there in terms of rules, case law and practice directions in your, your specific jurisdiction. There's been a lot said about witness statements. You could do a whole webinar, a whole host of webinars probably about uh, witness statements and the making of them and what's good and what's not good from time to time including in the current year judges put out messages via their judgments about uh, witness statements usually disparaging uh, for example witness statements that weren't taken in a timely way which is that first case there 2017 um, perhaps even more fundamentally worrying. Uh, 2018, a comment by a judge about the true voices of the witnesses and the extent of their real recollection, which was apparent when they were cross-examined over a number of days, were lacking from the witness statements. Interestingly, like participation, something that gets talked about a lot, the making of witness statements is also fundamental to the justice system, but there's very, very little research on it. I'm currently undertaking, also funded by the Nuffield Foundation, a project on witness statements. Uh, it's a fairly modest sized project, so we're just looking at uh, the employment tribunals and have conducted a number of interviews with practitioners, uh, barristers and solicitors in the main, and with judges as well, and panel members in the employment tribunal. And it's very interesting. There's a variety of views about how witness statements should be prepared, what their purpose is, how useful they are, and that, uh, that'll be research that I publish next year with Dr. Mattison. We're going to leave witness statements for a moment and think about witnesses in the hearings again and what's new uh, in the world of civil justice. Well, the Civil Justice Council, uh, less than a year ago, consulted about vulnerable witnesses and parties within civil procedures, pr proceedings. And in February of this year, produced a report with 18 recommendations for change, and they are significant. For example, they start off with a recommendation to amend the overriding objective to reflect the need to ensure that all parties can fully participate in proceedings and that all witnesses can give their best evidence. So those two concepts again coming through loud and clear. I thought it was particularly interesting that one of the recommendations is for questionnaires to have information about vulnerability or potential vulnerability of a party, including an obligation to disclose whether a party knows details of the vulnerability of another party or a witness. So it just underlines the, the importance of the court knowing about vulnerability and the responsibility that it's proposed is placed on parties to share about that vulnerability of course so that if something needs to be done adapted so that a witness can participate or give their best evidence uh, that can follow on and what sort of things would those adaptations entail potentially well a combination or one of these things for a start 
and these come from the special measures that are used day in day out in the criminal justice system when it's running as normal video links video recording uh, pre-recording of cross-examination even that's been available for a few years now in the criminal justice system the use of screens so uh, people can give their evidence uh, unseen and not seeing certain other people in the courtroom removal of wigs and gowns if it's a, a case that typically have wigs and gowns supporters and i i say here including the furry kind uh, it may or may not surprise you to know that for example in most american states certain witnesses can give evidence supported by court facility dogs now we don't have that in england and wales there's a research project going on about it at the moment a dog has been imported uh, in inverted commas for that uh, particular piece of research but uh, i know of at least one case in northern ireland where a uh, witness with autism who had an autism support dog gave evidence over a video link a court video link accompanied by his autism support dog obviously that was authorized by the judge who dealt with that at case management stage there are aids to communication that be can be used and they cover the whole gamut they cover things like maps timelines pictures models even and of course witness intermediaries i've added the etc because there is really no limit to the potential measures that could be used uh, in court if they're discussed with the judge and they are a, a legitimate way to support best evidence then they can be ordered but let's concentrate on witness intermediaries Witness intermediaries uh, have a specific uh, mention in the recommendations of that Civil Justice Council report. It called on the Ministry of Justice and uh, HMCTS to jointly review the availability and use, and use of intermediaries in the civil courts as a matter of urgency. I happen to know from discussions with the Ministry of Justice that a review uh, was started, but that was just before uh, lockdown and the extent to which uh, that has been able to carry, carry on during lockdown and what lockdown will have, how it will have impacted the work that was being done there, I don't know. Uh, the Civil Justice Council said there's a clear need to recruit and, retra and train intermediaries for the civil and family courts. Now, just a note here, that's not to say that intermediaries aren't being used in the civil and family courts. We're going to give you some examples shortly but there is no organized scheme in the way that there is for witnesses in the criminal justice system. So it, there's missing, for example, formal training or standard, I should say, training for intermediaries who work in civil and family courts. Also, there's missing a quality assurance scheme, um, etc. It's all rather ad hoc. Guidance is needed for all court users in relation to the availability, use and funding of intermediaries in civil courts. Yes, I agree certainly with that recommendation as well, because at the moment, each time an intermediary is used, applied for in the civil court, really all the parties and the judge are starting from scratch. There's no guidance that they can look to. There's no framework or well-trodden path about the funding of intermediaries in civil courts. So we certainly need that. As I say, they're already widely used, in particular in the criminal justice system and family justice system, system have been used in civil cases, mental health tribunals, employment tribunals. In fact, uh, Tom Tabori in 39 Essex Chambers, for example, had what we believe is the first uh, case where an intermediary is used in an employment tribunal. They're also used in witness interviews a lot in the criminal justice system. What do they do? If you're not familiar with the work of the intermediary, then in very short order, what I can say is they assess the witness's communication needs and abilities. They report by way of a written report on those communication needs and abilities. And that report goes to the, the lawyers, so the solicitors, the barristers, it also goes to the judge, and then the intermediary assists. They don't do the interview or the cross-examination, for example, but through that report, they advise how best to question that witness. And it's normal for them to be on hand. So for example, sitting next to a witness who's giving evidence when they're supported by an intermediary in order to step in if miscommunication occurs. 
If there's not an interview, it doesn't follow that it's too late to apply for one when it comes to the hearing. What will need to happen, and this is very well established um, in the criminal justice system and the family justice system, is a ground rules hearing. You might wonder what that is. Well, it's something that uh, became invented by yours truly when I was training the first intermediaries uh, for England and Wales nearly 20 years ago. And I recommended that they produced in their reports ground rules. So do's and don'ts for the advocates when it came to questioning the witnesses. And I soon discovered through research that although ground rules were discussed and the intermediaries thought agreed with advocates before the questioning started, it very often turned out that once questioning started in court, those ground rules that they thought had been agreed with the advocates flew out the window. So then the recommendation came from me to have a hearing involving the judge to get the judge's stamp of approval on the do's and don'ts. And it's up to the judge. The judge can uh, accept or reject the intermediaries' recommendations. The judge, of course, is in charge. But having that ground rules hearing before questioning starts is much better than taking a let's see how we get on approach or leaving it up to counsel to hopefully comply with what the recommendations are in the intermediary report. But if they don't, then the judge having to stop things and interrupt, uh, effect, uh, in effect, the, the witness's evidence and the questioning of the witness. If you want to know more about ground rules hearings, there's a, an article that I wrote uh, in 2015 with uh, two intermediaries. Do have a look at that. The link, the hyperlink to that is there. As I said, if you're applying in a civil case for an intermediary, then you might ask yourself, well, what's the eligibility? How are we going to know if this person uh, is likely to be entitled to one in the judge's view? Well, there isn't that guidance. There isn't that framework, as I've said. You can look to the criteria in the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act 1999 as an indicator. It's not going to bind any civil judge, but it's there um, as information to take into account when you're thinking about whether or not your witness is likely to get an intermediary. Those under 18 in the criminal justice system are eligible for an intermediary. Or if you're an adult and the quality of your evidence is likely to be diminished by reason of a mental disorder, a significant impairment of intelligence and social functioning, or a physical disability or a physical uh, disorder, then in the criminal justice system that opens the door uh, to the use of an intermediary. In the family justice system, like civil, civil justice, as I said, there, there haven't been working to uh, set criteria. There's more guidance now since the participation uh, rule and practice direction came in in 2017. Back in 2012, even before that, applications were being made for intermediaries in family justice. REM's notable, Lord Justice Thorpe, had to deal with the fact that they had already um, applied for an intermediary, but when wasn't, one wasn't available at the hearing, uh, the judge decided that it was best to plow on, basically. Um, the, the, ultimately, the um, decision, or the outcome of that case was appealed and Lord Justice Thorpe, although was being sympathetic, he was sympathetic to the judge in that case, um, with pressure of work and you know, keenness to get on with things, did say this, the trial judge fell into error in adopting the let's see how we get on management policy. It risks having to adjourn, not at the optimum moment before the trial is launched, but at a very late stage when things have run off the rails and then there is simply further wastage of court time. And it still happens. There was a case, for example, in November uh, of last year, again in the family courts, when things went off the rails and there was further wastage of time because it hadn't been appreciated early enough that the, the person giving evidence, uh, one of the parents in that family case, actually needed uh, support, including the support of an intermediary. So, Fitting in with our theme of getting it right first time, it's about knowing your witnesses, making the applications, getting things sorted before a witness gives evidence and uh, potentially going off the rails if there is a communication need 
that has not been taken into account. And intermediaries in civil cases, they are not brand new, even as uh, early as 2016, there was an intermediary applied for, and I should say about to be used really in the Queen's Bench Division. Though ultimately it wasn't possible to question the claimant, the video link went on, the intermediary was there, but it, it wasn't uh, possible even with intermediary support for the claimant to answer questions. But I, I flagged that up as what I believe is the first instance of an intermediary actually being involved in assessing a claimant, reporting, and then being available to support the witness at the final hearing. Another civil case involving uh, more than one member of 39 Essex Chambers is Kamathi. Sometimes it's hard, and it's not just in civil justice, it's hard to uh, find an intermediary. It might be that people agree one would assist, uh, as was uh, the case here, as agreed that intermediaries um, uh, couldn't be used because they couldn't find a suitable one, but that still meant there were issues regarding adaptations for or special measures as they're often called for the witnesses and if you look at the judgment in Kamathi you can see there that the parties agreed witnesses should be given breaks during their evidence translator and witness visible at all times during the video link witnesses allowed a companion in the room whilst uh, they gave evidence and wigs and gowns would not be worn and those are examples that's not a template of things that apply for all vulnerable witnesses vulnerable witnesses need to be viewed as individuals with their own particular communication needs and abilities there is no set definition of what is vulnerable uh, you have to take each witness as you find them and it's best to obviously get it right before the questioning of a witness in a hearing and uh, that means make sure they've had effective witness preparation you know them you've built a rapport with them they know what's likely to happen you understand how they feel about the prospect of giving evidence in light of what they've been told they they may be able to tell you that they are likely to need adjustments I have dealt with many, many cases, big commercial disputes, where it has been the case that despite being involved in the litigation over a period of, of years, actually it has only come to light uh, shortly before the hearing that a witness has an additional communication issue arising from a, a mental or a physical incapacity. They need to be dealt with beforehand and if necessary applications made to the court and those applications these days are usually uncontroversial because we all agree that witnesses need to be able to effectively participate so if you've got uh, your witness preparation right you should know if they're likely to need adjustments what they are whether they're opposed or agreed if you're going to have to make an application and uh, if the application is granted when that all important ground rules hearing will take place we're now going to go on to case examples i'm going uh, to stop my video and nicola is going to start hers nicola has hey. joined us uh, hi I, i'll leave the slides hi. up and uh Nicola, if you could just say next slide, please, I'll move them along for you. So do you want me to move to the next slide? Uh, well, I was actually going to speak for a moment without uh, the benefit of slides between me and my audience. I'm find, I find it very difficult just talking into a camera rather than being able to um, look at the whites of people's eyes. But I wanted to just talk very briefly about my experience of using intermediaries, um, which Penny's had some involvement in, uh, as well uh, as, as one of the, the experts used in the case of AB in Hampshire, which was a judicial review last year um, in the Queen's Bench Division. Uh, uh, sorry, not in the Queen's Bench Division, a judicial review with Paul Bowen QC, which looked at um, the failure of a uh, police force to use an intermediary um, in a criminal investigation concerning a, a, an adolescent boy with learning difficulties and uh, Down syndrome who came home from residential care and intimated to his parents that he had been uh, the victim of a violent sexual assault. And the police progressed the um, investigation quite far in that case, but ultimately didn't bring a prosecution because they found 
having carried out uh, a lengthy um, uh, witness investigation and a lengthy discussion with the young man that they couldn't get him to articulate exactly what he said had happened or to identify in precise words who he said his assailant was and that case is interesting because it shows that that while it's important for um, police forces to uh, use all their best endeavours to uh, assist vulnerable witnesses in uh, putting across their evidence. In this case, because the young man had been provided with unregistered intermediaries, the court found in the form of his teachers, the fact that, that the police hadn't been able to find registered intermediaries to help them communicate didn't mean that, meant that there hadn't been uh, a breach either of his Article 3 rights or, or of the police's breach of statutory duty. Uh, and I think that case is interesting because it shows, you know, as Penny's been saying, um, intermediaries are hugely important and they're hugely val valuable resources to vulnerable witnesses, but they are very thin on the ground. And so the reality is in, in many instances, they're not available to witnesses and the courts uh, have been slow to suggest that, that it, there is an obligation to provide them, particularly registered intermediaries, in all instances. Um, I've had better luck in finding an intermediary and, and using one in the court of protection which is where um, I do the majority of my work and it seems to me that there's a growing um, realization in the court of protection of the importance of assisting uh, participants in, in proceedings to get their evidence across as well as they're able and obviously that's one of the fundamental principles of the act uh, that no decisions can be made on part of a, a person unless um, all, all steps have been taken to assist them to um, make decisions for themselves. But it also goes for witnesses who may be engaged in court protection proceedings, who may have difficulty in communicating. So, for example, I, had, uh, I was involved in a long-running case, which had been a family case, and then progressed into the court of protection as the um, young adult became an adult in, in, at the centre of proceedings. And in that case, um, P's parents both had quite serious learning difficulties and their children had been removed and there was a long-running fact-finding hearing uh, in front of a judge um, about whether or not they were in fact able to look after their daughter as they said they were and in that case we used an intermediary and it was an intermediary from community court and we agreed ground rules of the kind that um, Penny's been talking about and Penny if you, if you can bring up the slide there you'll see I've managed to dredge through my um, old files and find the actual ground rules that we used in that case. And you can see you know, the parties agreed them and then the, these are actually part of the order. Um, and that was that the oath was to be taken at the commencement of proceedings, that there were breaks um, hourly um, and that they were, they'd be taken during um, the father's evidence uh, that if he needed an additional break he could raise his hand or ask for assistance and the questions in fact um, were they were shown to the intermediary before cross-examination uh, it was the night before because it was a four-day hearing and um, the intermediary didn't of course change them but would express to the council involved you know th that question will be difficult for the father to understand because it's a tagged question because it's got multiple factors to it you know I, I suggest it would be broken down and then it was for the advocate to do that but it, it meant that um, the father could participate in proceedings in a way that he would otherwise have struggled to do it also meant um, the uh, the community court intermediary sat with him throughout the proceedings and explained evidence that he didn't understand as it went along uh, asked for pauses in order that he could he could speak to his counsel if he needed and the whole process um, was far far easier and it seems to be far fairer to him than it might otherwise have been and it did ultimately um, result in in the daughter being returned to the family home to live with her parents um, so the moral of that is of course that it's important particularly um, for those of you who might work in the court of protection or, or in areas which are particularly likely to have vulnerable, um, uh, vul sorry, I'm just getting a WhatsApp from, from the people running the webinar, just checking that I haven't fallen off air. Um, 
So that it's important, particularly those of you who practice in the court of protection or in areas which use vulnerable witnesses or engage vulnerable parties of any form, always to consider the possibility that an intermediary um, might be of assistance to you and whether or not that's, that's something um, that might assist. Having said that, slightly cautionary tale um, is the case of Brian John Morrow and Shrewsbury Football Club. Um, and I think I've got a slide of that, if um, Penny can put that one up. Um, that was uh, a personal injury claim, which uh, some of you uh, may be aware. Geoffrey Brown from Chambers um, was counsel for the defendant in that. And it, it was a claim brought by uh, Mr Morrow, who had been struck by a goalpost while watching um, uh, a, a rugby match, a very unfortunate accident. He was struck by a, a goalpost on the head and suffered, he claimed, uh, a somatosome uh, disorder and he said he had a re resurgence of his pre-existing epilepsy. Um, the club admitted liability, but, but there was a dispute as to the nature and the extent of his injuries. Now, Mr. Morrow, um, as a result, both of his underlying condition and the injuries he'd suffered, um, said that he suffered profound anxiety and that the process of cross-examination would be extremely difficult for him. And on that basis, um, the court at uh, under HHA Bird agreed to the use of an intermediary but when it went in front of Mrs Justice Farby ultimately she was quite scathing in um, the use that she said an intermediary had to proceedings and I, I put up a quote for you there I won't read it all out but she talks about um, the intermediary's contribution to the proceedings being negligible uh, about her providing minimal assistance, about the claimant being more than able to demonstrate when it was that he needed a break. And um, she uh, congratulated Mr. Brown, Jeff Jeffrey Brown, on his handling of the case and made the point that uh, a barrister well acquainted with his craft and his duties to the court uh, is more than capable in many cases of properly accommodating a vulnerable witness. That said, um, I don't, I don't think that this, this case should be used to um, stop people from seeking the use of an intermediary in cases where it is useful, but it's just a cautionary tale that it needs to be properly thought through when and if it is going to be used. Um, and then the final issue uh, is, is the matter of, of funding, um, which is how, how you go about funding uh, an intermediary and I think I saw some questions already coming in um, which apologies I haven't had an opportunity to answer but Penny might answer them for me uh, while we're still speaking uh, and I must confess that this is something that I asked um, my solicitor uh, Emma Earnshaw from Owen Mitchell who, who's worked with me on a number of cases uh, because this is something that frankly I've often um, relied on my solicitors quite heavily for uh, in terms of getting the funding and and, and she's discussed with me the process that, that we went through. And obviously there are two key providers um, outside the court service, which are Communicourt and Triangle. Uh, and the first step in engaging uh, an intermediary is to contact the provider and get a quote. Um, and then have a recital in the order which recognises the importance uh, of having um, an intermediary. And I've got a slide up there that I think Penny has which shows uh, the kind of recital that a court might make on agreeing that uh, an intermediary will be appropriate. And that's recording that whoever has a learning disability will be assisted by the provision of an intermediary, uh, that the solicitors have made contact with Communicor or whichever provider of intermediary services, um, the cost of, of carrying out intermediary services, um, and in this case, uh, that they're not recoverable under the legal aid certificate that we, that we had um, for the claimant, uh, but that they were necessary for his proper participation in the case. Uh, and they were authorised to be paid by uh, Her Majesty's court service. And after that, you have to um, complete a booking form, send it back to the intermediary service. Uh, and then in that case, there was a six week waiting period while we waited to see if we could get somebody, it's often unfortunately longer than that. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, after that process has gone through, uh, the intermediary can be booked. 
so it's a lengthy process it it's it's um does involve some work uh but from my experience of using intermediaries it can be extremely worthwhile and of course penny who still seems to be black i'm not quite sure why maybe she'll pop back up um has has even more uh far more experience of that and can probably uh, tell you a little bit more i'm here again hello <laughs> Um, thank you for that, Nicola. It's really, really interesting and uh, very useful to see those examples of, of ground rules as well. And indeed, um, the example where the judge was unimpressed by the intermediary. I think that is a, an outlier case, um, but it's an important one to note anyway. And I think whichever judge you go in front of, you've got to make your, sure your application is really tight and you've got the evidence to support the need for, for an intermediary. Uh, on ter in terms of the, the finding them and funding them, Nicola, I think you've covered the points really well. You've talked about the, the two main providers, Communicort and Triangle. There are a number of other intermediaries who offer their services, but they're individual practitioners. I suppose they're, in that sense, they're harder to find um, because uh, you're not going to uh, a body like Communicort and, or Triangle, an organisation. You, you need to know that they are that they are around in order to, to find them. Um, I think Intermediaries for Justice as well as an organisation, it's a representative body that can potentially help someone who's looking uh, for an intermediary. The only point that I would make, and it's somewhat really um, repeating what I've said before, is that because you're operating outside of the criminal justice system where the Ministry of Justice provides registered intermediaries, I think it's just like you would with an expert witness, you need to really be clear that they have the expertise that you want and be satisfied that they have good skills and that they're going to be effective at court. In terms of the funding point, I think it's really interesting, Nicola, to hear that the, the HMCTS was going to be the bearer of the costs for the intermediary in that case where there was uh, public funding. I don't think the point's ever been argued, and I'm addressing it because it's come up in, in one of the questions, about what happens when you've got privately uh, funded uh, parties. Who bears the costs for an intermediary if you need one and then you succeed? I don't think that's ever been established, but certainly in family law um, as well, where cases are publicly funded, then the court foots the bill. There was a whole slew of, of case law when the president of the family division was getting uh, increasingly um, frustrated, the former president, I should say, Sir James Mumby, over funding of intermediaries um, a few years ago. Legal Aid Board just saying, sorry, no, you know, we're not, we're not funding that. And they wouldn't, and that's why the courts, family courts fund intermediaries, and it sounds like civil courts are, are following, following that lead. I yeah, don't I, I, I think it's, in my minimal experience, um, I think it's it's very much at the discretion of the court, uh, because in in the case that I was talking about there, um, we had a sympathetic judge, and of course it was in the court of protection when the issue was litigation capacity, so it was fundamental to the working of the court per mm. se, um, and uh, I wouldn't like to say for certain whether that was determinative. But I, I also, I would be cautious about suggesting that you will always get funding for yeah. an intermediary in circumstances yeah. when you might want one. Or even, even always get an intermediary. It reminds me of a case that I was instructed on to advise, PI case, where the claimant had uh, sustained severe brain injury, but nevertheless, the uh, defendants and insurers have persuaded the judge that she ought to give evidence and be cross-examined. And an application was made for an intermediary, but it, uh, it wasn't uh, successful. But I was brought in to advise on the other measures that ought to be in place, even if there wasn't going to be an, an intermediary. And I, th I think that's one of the difficulties, and, th and that's one of the issues that Mrs Justice Farby um, addresses, actually, in, in the Morrow and Shrewsbury case, is that, that because we have an adversarial system, some of the issues that arise, some of the the crunch points in uh, cross-examination are exactly the reason for cross-examination and the fact that 
they might make uh, a witness anxious and find it difficult for them to ar answer. Um, that's the barrister's job in some senses in order to test the evidence and push it to its very limit and make sure that the, 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 the best evidence comes out. And so Mrs. Justice Farby was, was very critical of any uh, intervention by an intermediary which might seem to come between uh, the barrister's ability to properly cross-examine and push the evidence yeah. and the witness responses. So I suppose that, that's, that's the tension. Yeah, and, and absolutely, it's a tension that really has come to the fore in the criminal justice system. And there is recent Court of Appeal um, dicta about that, saying that, you know, the intermediaries are there um, to help that person be questioned. And, that, you know, there's plenty of, of rules and um, guidance about intermediaries being impartial there to assist everybody. But what happened in criminal justice with vulnerable witnesses, I think certain defence counsel thought, well, it's better for me not to cross-examine this person at all, because in lieu of that, in the criminal courts, it was established that if you couldn't cross-examine the uh, vulnerable witness, who you know, very often the complainant, you'd be able to address the jury and say, look, I would have I would have asked this, I would have asked that, these are the points that I would have made in cross-examination, and in fact, actually ended up with an additional sort of mini speech partway through the trial as well as your, your final speech or um, submission. So I think what the Court of Appeal needed to address in the um, criminal division was this point that if you can at all cross-examine a witness, you should. And it goes back to the very old principle that it's the witness's right, isn't it, to respond to the accusations or the different version of the truth that is being put by the other side. Um, and it's it's down to all of us advocates with or without an intermediary to make sure we get those challenges across to the witnesses uh, and they get given the opportunity to to answer it answer them are there any other questions you think that we haven't um addressed and that we ought to Nicholas? well we've had we had a lot of questions asking for your uh, very brilliant slides Penny, and I think the answer is that, that we can put them online. Absolutely, they're going to go up online and I think um, that'll be within the next few days when the recording of this goes up, the slides will be there too. Um, and then there's, there's, there's quite a, a, a complicated question about witnesses in safeguarding cases, which I think uh, I'll, I'll respond to separately. Rather than yes, I saw that one, it mentions the accused and we've got issues there about disclosure if it's in the yep. criminal, criminal courts as well so yes and we can deal with that one afterwards so if there's if there's nothing else in terms of the uh, the questions is there anything else that you would like to say Nicola I I I, I don't believe so say for uh, thank you for having me thank you for sharing uh, this platform with me obviously world expert and junior counsel so I'm, I'm very grateful Oh, thank, thank you for joining. It's been great. Thank you to all the participants who joined this, those who were new to these, um, this series of webinars and indeed those who returned for another webinar. Thank you very much.